There are many people who don't want to admit they're voting for Kamala Harris. They're in families that might be MAGA adjacent or full on MAGA. A lot of women fall into that category. Women who've seen their reproductive freedoms yanked away from them by a radical activist Supreme Court. They know that even if they don't focus on all the specifics of Project 2025, that this is the essential agenda of another Trump administration. In other words, you've test driven him once. You now know what you're going to get when you buy the car again. So the feeling is, and this is just to Brian Reich's point or to his prediction, that if those women show up en masse in significant enough numbers, it would shift the electorate significantly in a way that's not being polled right now. The reason it's not being polled is for the reason I just mentioned, which is people don't want to admit that they're voting for Kamala Harris. Which is so weird because I would imagine it is more embarrassing to say you're a Trumper. I guess it depends on where you live, right? Well, it's great that you say that because there is also that way to look at the electorate, which is there are a lot of people that don't want to admit that they're voting for Donald Trump for all the crazy for all the unhinged lunacy and for all the autocratic instinct that is Donald Trump. But for whatever reason, they're attracted to his machismo. They're attracted to, you know, his perceived strength, even though we know, you know, it's all a show. For those reasons, they're going to vote for Donald Trump, but they don't want to say it. And so those people are underrepresented in polling. So you take a step back and you go, okay, is this polling then that we've seen that puts everything in kind of this margin of error, is it in any way dependable? Sounds as though there could be a significant number of people that fall into the, I don't want to admit I'm running, I'm voting for Harris, or mm-hmm. I don't want to admit I'm voting for Trump categories to the point that it's not a measurable thing. So now to Reich's point here, he would, uh, our commenter, Mm -hmm. you know, it's possible that they show up in huge numbers, women or the Trumpies who don't want to admit they're Trumpies, closet Trumpies, and they make this election less than close. I do think Kamala Harris will win the popular vote by a lot. That's just not relevant to the way we pick a president. Copper says, a lot of women pressured to vote for Trump will fill out ballots at home under others' eyes, not in a private polling booth. The idea that someone could control the way I vote is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling, but that's not wrong. That's not wrong. I mean, and and, uh, there was just a huge piece today. It was front page of the New York Times. I know nobody gets the old school paper, Mm -hmm. but um, I might be able to find it for you. But the the headline is... um, Uh, GOP's drive for early vote gains traction. Here's what it looks like in the old school paper that Grandpa reads. (laughs) Okay, Okay. Boomer. Do you see? Yeah, I'm a Boomer. (laughs) So GOP's drive for early vote gains traction. That's a stark turnabout, they note. So Republicans have traditionally voted on Election Day, right? That was a big thing in 2016, Mm -hmm. big thing in 2020. Well, they spent millions of dollars and months to push Donald Trump's loyal supporters to change their minds about voting early, right? So now they think in exit polling and in additional polling, there is evidence to suggest that it is working, that Trumpies, people who support MAGA land, are voting early. After polls opened on Tuesday in Wisconsin, some form of early voting has commenced in all seven of the swing states. And as of Monday, they note 17 million people nationwide had already cast a vote. And there are initial indications that Republicans are showing up to the ballots, um, to the polls or returning absentee ballots, excuse me, with more gusto than in recent years. In many cases, Republican officials and canvassers on the ground are spurring their voters on with the same debunked conspiracy theories about fraud that Trump has used to sow doubt about the integrity of the count. 
So essentially they're saying the early voting is easy, convenient, and it gets you away from gambling on whether your vote is actually going to be counted if you vote on election day. They've really reversed the whole narrative. It's a remarkable turnabout from four years ago, they note, when Trump had thoroughly demonized every method of voting that didn't occur in person on election day. As states expanded access to mail and absentee voting at the height of the COVID pandemic, Trump repeatedly discouraged his voters from taking advantage. He said that mail-in ballots created chaos and confusion. Of course, he was saying without evidence that it would lead to, you know, election interference by many foreign countries. He was just throwing everything up. So anyway, those people who used to wait till election day, many of them have now shown up early. And so this huge surge in early voting, which we'd normally ascribe to a big Democratic push in voters, cannot be ascribed to Democratic voters necessarily. Um this is, but who are they voting for? I would argue Kamala. Or maybe they just won't vote on the day. The numbers have not increased, uh, the trick era says. Republican voters are proving that gaslighting works. It is true that there is a crush of lies that is associated with a lot of election, uh, I would say, um, ads primarily, but also by the rhetoric that's being pursued by talking heads and the GOP punditry, the um, instrument really of propaganda that is the Fox News channel. And so you are just, in essence, challenged to find out the truth because you are overwhelmed with lies. So first, I wanted to give you some truth on the economy. I will get to politics, girl, here in a second. And then I will uh, share. This is what we'll do. We'll do. I want you to see this one thing on the economy. Mm -hmm. This is from a uh, an award winning economist. And they polled a bunch of Nobel Prize winning economists. And we'll just run that real quick. And then I want to show you the Tucker Carlson thing, which is just going to make your head explode. It's crazy that, you know, if any Democrat had gotten away, had had said what, um, Tucker Carlson said they never would have gotten away with it. Tumbleweed with a super chat. You were going to talk about the troll yesterday. Thank you, Tumbleweed. I've lost my way, and I thought maybe somebody would bring me back to Magnetic North on this show. <laughs> anyway, that we had a troll who was particularly aggressive and nasty. Yeah. And uh, I actually went in and deleted him from the chat yesterday after hours, but... Just a warning that Kim is going to be watching the chat more. I don't really watch the chat so much when I do. Uh, you know, I only catch little bits and pieces. So try to keep it respectful. I don't, I really, you know, I welcome people to disagree with me. I that is a damning non-answer. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> the point is I uh, do my best to uh, welcome those who disagree. But by the same token, uh, you know, the flame throwing, we just don't do it here. Uh, I bet Trump will claim victory on an election night before California polls close, uh, says oh, Michael. Um, well, one strategy, by the way, is that the Trump uh, propaganda associated with the polling, which is we're doing so well. Now, he always says that we're doing so well. We've never done so well. They've never seen, you know, that when he loses, he will point to the fact that his polling and the polling was showing him so far ahead, how could he possibly lose except for the fact that, what, it must not be a fair and free election. So he's going to claim election fraud because it doesn't in any way, that loss, conform to the propaganda associated with how well he's doing in polling. So he puts out the propaganda about how well he's doing in polling, and that way when he loses, he can say, well, you can see, it's not legitimate. Because look, we've been polling for months, and we were way ahead, and all of a sudden, where are all those votes? A record turnout was a win for Biden, and it's going to be an even bigger win this time for Kamala Harris, says Brad Forward. All right. Uh, maybe you could get someone to speak about the red mirage and the blue shift. I am seeing articles about it, says Sally. Yeah, um, mm. I remember the—I thought one of the best people on that 
Last time that we had on the show was Jim Avalov, the former ABC News correspondent. I don't know that he can, he might be able to still comment on, on that. Um, you know, he's just uh, not able to take an official position because of, you know, he's a, a he's a journalist. Uh, I'm running out of time, Albert. Um, I'm going to now uh, table the economics and the, um, don't you think, Kim? Otherwise, we won't get to politics, girl, in time. Yeah, let's do it. Go, go, go. So let's, uh, so I'll tell you, Albert, why don't we run, uh, just give me the the Tucker Carlson thing. It was just crazy, and I don't understand how this didn't get more of a reaction, just because he's so unhinged. Now, before you see it, and then I'll shut up, the first 30 seconds, you feel as though you could almost get away with this style of propaganda, which is essentially things are out of control, daddy's coming home, and he's angry. Okay, and he's going to make things right. That's going to really play to that crowd. But then, after 30 seconds, he takes it even beyond that to this bizarre, creepy, pervy, awful place. Roll it. If you allow your two-year-old to smear the contents of his diapers on the wall of your living room, and you do nothing about it, if you allow your 14-year-old to light a joint at the breakfast table, if you allow your hormone-addled 15-year-old daughter to, like, slam the door of her bedroom and give you the finger, you're going to get more of it. And those kids are going to wind up in rehab. It's not good for you, and it's not good for them. No. There has to be a point at which dad comes home. Yeah, that's right. Dad comes home. And he's pissed. Dad is pissed. He's not vengeful. He loves his children. Disobedient as they may be, he loves them. Because they're his children, they live in his house. But he's very disappointed in their behavior. And he's gonna have to let them know. He's gonna have to get to your room right now and think about what you did and when dad gets home, you know what he says? You've been a bad girl. You've been a bad little girl and you're getting a vigorous spanking right now. And no, it's not gonna hurt me more than it hurts you. No, it's not. I'm not gonna lie. This is gonna hurt you a lot more than it hurts me. And you earned this. You're getting a vigorous spanking because you've been a bad girl. And it has to be this way. It has to be this way because it's true. And you're only going to get better when you take responsibility for what you did. That's not said in the spirit of hate. It's not said in the spirit of vengeance or bigotry. Far from it. It's said in the spirit of justice, which is the purest and best thing there is. And without it, things fall apart. And so you saw how absolutely horrifying that got. And so he then introduces Donald Trump by saying, you know, daddy's home and the exactly. crowd chants, daddy's home, daddy's home. And I'm thinking, is that what America wants? Is that what these people want? They want a daddy who's going to come spank the living crap out of you? I have a 15-year-old daughter. I can't imagine my relationship with her if I was spanking the hell out of her. That's either super pervy uh, advocating child abuse. I don't know what that is. I don't, I'm, I'm so grossed out by him. I think you're right to be grossed out by him. And by the way, if you want your kid in rehab, and by the way, many things go into whether or not a child ends up in rehab. It's a very, it's, it's a, it's an almost unknowable multifaceted problem, how people become, uh, addicted to any number of things. Uh, you're just, if not more likely, as likely to have that child end up in a bad place if you start with this corporal punishment thing at home. I mean, you know, you start, you know, beating your kid like that. That's a that's an abusive, awful uh, home life. Uh, again, he is a despicable character, I think. Yeah. And the crowd was not completely with him there. You began to see, if you look around, people kind of going, mm. in other words, they weren't, now, there were enough people chanting, and they're all Trumpies there in the hall, that they, you know, daddy's home, daddy's home, I guess, you know, that mm -hmm. won the day in terms of chanting, <laughs> but I think he did lose a little of the crowd as he kind of began it. If there's time, we'll run it again toward the end of the show. Um, 
Uh, Asborn from uh, Norway uh, writes us in the super chat. Uh, da- Dad should have thought Donald uh, some empathy. Perhaps USA would not be in such peril. Yeah, if there was empathy. But old Fred was a terrible dad and thought just hate. Yeah, uh, Fred Trump, Donald Trump's dad, um, clearly didn't raise a, a child who had any sense of uh, right and wrong. His brother, actually, Donald Trump's brother, was a, and he was the one who was really being, he was the one who was being uh, initially thought of to take over the Trump business. He was a better guy from what I've read and uh, various biographies that would uh, suggest that. Thank you for the, uh, the comment. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.